Comic books are serious business. So, I made a video about the Fantastic Four, a, a long documentary style look at their history, what they mean to the zeitgeist of comic books as a medium, and really just why I love them and, and why I've always loved them. Uh, I thought it was really long, incomprehensible, I was so stressed that it was just the ramblings of a madman put into a video and that nobody would like it, and uh, I spent a very long time putting it together, and I put it out in the world, and people were really nice. I got nothing but, but lovely comments about that video, and uh, I don't think you guys realize how validating it is. I've had a lot of, um, I'd like to say, a lack of lucidity in my life, in my brain, and it's always wonderful to know that it's not, uh, it's, it's not for nothing, that, that it actually means something to, to people. But uh, that's a very roundabout way of saying thank you to everyone who watched that video, to everyone who commented and who supported it. It's, uh, it's been an absolute pleasure reading what you guys have had to say. However, there was one comment in particular that, that really caught me because not only did they sort of break down all the reasons why they liked the video, they also broke down all of uh, my processes. They managed to recognize the closest I've ever seen everything I was doing in that video, and it was, uh, it was wonderful to see that. It was wonderful to know that uh, someone had seen what I was doing so clearly that uh, they felt there was a method to my madness, and that's always, again, very validating to see. So, uh, in response to that, I kind of want to go through a couple of details uh, and frequently asked questions to sort of give you an idea of how the video came together and some of the stuff that I put in there you might have missed because I, I didn't necessarily make all of that clear and there's certain things that I guess it would be nice for people to know and not just remain locked in my head. So, uh, let's get started. It's always a danger when I, when I run my mouth uh, because, you know, I do have bullet points in front of me but I, I'm bad with with uh, on-the-spot words, so we'll see how that formulates, probably into a big stinky stew. I can tell this took so much effort, but uh, how much? Well, uh, from the start, I knew this was going to be very different to my other videos. Uh, I've, ha I've got a list of things I know I want to cover. Sly Cooper was one of them, uh, Psychonauts was another, Hill Street Blues, there's, there's a series of things I knew I wanted to get to, but with the Fantastic Four, it was such a, a, a struggle to find an angle. I really wasn't sure what direction to approach it at. And I also knew that it would have been very easy to just make a video going, these are my favorite runs, Is, aren't they great? Hey, here's a bunch of random images from the comic to fill in the gaps of what I'm saying. And, and people would watch it and go, yeah, I get it, and then switch off. Uh, if I wanted to make people feel the way I feel about them, I needed to... to get you to empathize. I needed to find a way to get the audience to see them as I saw them. And the only way I was going to do that was by getting more ambitious with the project. I needed to really consider every angle and, and just try and um, patch up any hole that I could see that, that, that leaks might be getting in from. What kind of analogy is this? I don't even know. So about two years ago, I uh, started making money off of what I was doing. And the minute that happened, I went, I need to start putting this you know, where my mouth is. I need to actually uh, make projects that are worthy of, of what people are investing now. And I feel like Fantastic Four was the natural first choice to, to uh, rise above uh, all the other stuff that I do. So I, um, I started doing the extra research. I, of course, have a solid foundation of Fantastic Four from my childhood. Uh, I'll go through my comics at some point as an extra video, but basically my dad used to collect the John Byrne series when I was a kid. This was when I was also watching, you know, the Fantastic Four on TV, but, you know, when we lived in our one-bedroom uh, flat many, many, many years ago, when I was like five or whatever, we, we had uh, all these comics just hidden under the bed, uh, and I would, I would dig through all of it and, and just got really hooked on so many different uh, characters, Spider-Man and... You know, a little bit of Batman and Superman, but mostly it was Marvel stuff. The Avengers and Moon Knight and Daredevil and X-Men and, you know, all of them. But uh, Fantastic Four was one of those that just really stuck out. So I had that going for me. I also had, uh, in the UK, we have this thing called the Collector's Edition, which is a reprint of comics from America uh, a couple months to a year behind when they're printed in the States. But what was great about them when I bought them growing up was that they would have three issues in one. So you would get a couple issues of the current run, sometimes you would get an entire story in three issues in one comic. 
sometimes you would get prints of uh, a couple modern stories and then stories from side stories or one shots or things from all over history and the fantastic four comic when the movie came out was printed and would have whatever was going on in the present day and the jack and stan story as the very last story of the comic the very last issue at the back of the book so i was able to catch up with the the present and the past in my lifetime but of course Still not enough, there was always going to be stuff that I'd missed and blind spots I needed to pick up on. I needed to read 1, 2, 3, 4. I needed to get to grips with all of Marvel Knights. I needed to read X-Men vs. Uh, Fantastic Four, which has the most hilarious series of covers I've ever seen. It, there, there's so many uh, uh, comics that I had to uh, peruse and go through and read and reread and get the sticky notes out and start, you know, saving pages that had interesting panels or ideas expressed. And that I did behind doing all the other things in my life uh, for quite some time. When I say the video took two years, a solid year of that was probably research and writing. The writing, of course, changed so many times uh, through the process. I, I was never sure of exactly what shape it should take. And at some point while I was writing it, I'm like, the best way I can really put people in the shoes of myself and any other fans and the history of it all is they need to experience the characters as characters. And that's when I knew I needed to, to do some casting. I decided as well that I was going to get very ambitious. Originally it was only going to be like 50 scenes I was going to get people to voice and I think it ended up being like 90 scenes or something of, of, of just little bits I couldn't resist just putting out there stuff I've been carrying around in my brains for years. And 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 with those two elements combined, the voice acting and and the way I was writing it, it became something that I needed to express and and structure as a story. One of the things I do with my video essays is that I don't give out information until it's uh, relevant dramatically. And I feel that that is a storytelling skill. I feel that that's something that you need to do to get the audience on your side. If you're going to make a video that's two hours long, you need to really justify that. The video could have easily been four hours long, but the way I structured it was deliberately so that it had a sort of beginning, middle and end. You need to make the video flow as though it's a story because that's what keeps the audience invested. That's what keeps them coming back to it and picking up on details. If you do it as just a flat series of points, that's fine. I mean, that's a perfectly valid point of content. I, I watched so many versions of that, but in this case, it, I needed you to feel something. And the only way I can do that is by, you know, using the techniques I would have used if I was making a show or making a movie or whatever. So that was very important to me uh, to pitch it that way. The same thing goes for the editing. I had to think really carefully about what gets shown on screen. A, a good example that I left in so I could talk about this point, there's a shot when I talk about, you know, Doom it rules in a castle and everyone else can piss off, but the image I use of Doom gesticulating uh, from the castle walls is not Doom, it's of Nathaniel Richards. I realized, oh wait, somebody's gonna look at that image, even though it's perfect for my purpose, and go, oh that's, you know, Nathaniel, you, what are you talking about? You, you, you're a fake. And that's the kind of thing I think when I put these things together. I, you know, would get panels when I want to make a point, and, and, and put it against another panel and make, you know, a, a grueling decision about is it better to put this panel there or this panel? What is the best image to use for this context? So I really thought about that a lot. Every decision you see in the video was something I sweated over. Even the images, you know, in the credits at the end of the video, when I'm showing the song and I say, you know, and it says uh, they were transformed in the most fantastic ways. Yeah, I, I can show them using their powers and like, oh, it transformed them in these fantastic ways. But actually, I wanted to show them just being happy, just being happy to to be this family and to be with each other. And 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 that to me was more emotionally. It's it's a you know it's a three second thing, but but I you know took like. <laughs> I took like half a day choosing those images and finding the right images uh, that I maybe hadn't used through the rest of the video in the same way. So I sweated over every uh, decision you see there. I, and again, there obviously there are images I knew I wanted to use in certain places, but a lot of the editing was pretty fast and loose. I would put in all the stuff that I knew uh, I wanted visually for the video and then be like, okay, now let's trawl through the comics over and over again and all my notes until I find something that I think is perfectly suited to to this section or this section. This was probably way more work than you needed for all this stuff, but I think um, while that I would do differently and was probably very nonsensical, 
uh, one of the things that I thought was a little bit more sensible was that for the scenes with the dialogue, I needed to not have the panels, and this is something the comments uh, I talked about picked up on, I needed to not have the panels just be, the person is talking, so I'm going to show the panel where they're talking. In some cases, even the comics don't do that. You need to flow it uh, so that people are getting all the aspects of the context of that situation. And in a lot of other cases, sometimes you're, you're directing something and you're going, I, I don't know if just showing these two people talking is enough. I don't think that that breaks the scene up very nicely or gives you, uh, or gives you enough intrigue. One of my favorite uh, edits that, that really messes with, with what's in the, in the comic book in order to deliver the emotional context is the fight between uh, Doom and Reed. Because that a lot of those images I used aren't in those pages. They're from other pages in the comic that I took and, and color graded so that they had the same uh, look. Uh, the idea of doing that is because um, when you're editing you only have so much coverage from using the pages as they are and I needed to find a way to cheat that out and reflect what the actors were doing with the script. Those two guys took a hold of the dialogue in a way that just blew me away and I needed to cover that with the uh, material I had as opposed to just going from what was exactly on the pages. And and at the same time you want to get the same uh, impact that the scene is trying to get across. You're trying to adapt it in, in the best possible way and I hope I got away with that. I mean obviously I'm giving all the secrets away here but uh, I thought it was very important to um, make the flow of those scenes uh, really, really have an impact, and uh, I, I think I think I managed it. It was also a great excuse to get as much of the Fantastic Four comics in one video as possible, and uh, it was just a nice way to kill two birds with one stone. You know, and I'm also I'm thinking about sound effects. When do I need sound effects? When is the the best time to to put something in there? I learned about sound levels. I had the gaming brick come in and go, "What the fuck are you doing with these?" above a decibel uh, <laughs> uh, soundscapes and I, I learnt a lot about how to be a, a sound mixer. Um, whether or not I achieved that entirely is, is up to the viewer but I yeah I, it's the first video where I really realized oh man I need to learn what peaking is and, and you know it's mostly for the actors because you want to make sure that they're being portrayed in the best possible light and not being screwed up by some insane non-sound person putting together a massive documentary. Again, it's something, it's a process that just took a really long time. I'd say a, a year or so for the research and, and then an extra bit for the writing. Casting and uh, getting the dialogue in took a couple of months. And then the final video itself was a, a labor of about three months of editing. Three months of solid get up in the morning, just, just sit in front of that computer and get it done editing. And uh, I didn't really go out and see people in that time. So it was uh, a lot, uh, a lot of effort, but uh, the results have made it totally worthwhile. I think the nicest thing about doing it is that it forced me to take on a bunch of skills that I've always wanted to take on, but have just been, I've never had an excuse to do it or a platform to do it on. And now suddenly I'm in a position where I can make something from nothingness. I can, I can, I can make it all possible. That, that means more than you know. That means way more than you know. I really wanted it out by Christmas, that didn't happen, but you can hopefully sort of see why I might have been after that vibe. So yeah, the irony of all of this is that it's not going to make that much money. Um, the video got hit by a couple of copyright strikes, which I expected. Uh, there were just the the songs that I needed in that video, and I mean need. Uh, it, it wouldn't have been fulfilling if they hadn't been the ones chosen. I don't know if I would do it again. I learned so much that would allow me to condense it after this on, on other videos, but man am I glad that I, I got it done and, and I can say I did it. These are cool man, where can I read them? I'm gonna put out a guide that recommends what uh, comics you can buy um, because there are certain runs that are collected and they're easy to find and all you need is to be pointed in the right direction. I've had a lot of people come to me and be like, I don't know where to start. I know exactly the places you can go now, uh, so I'll, I'll get a list together of uh, what I hope are both uh, collectible and affordable options. I'll also put the unaffordable ones in there in case you're a weird millionaire who just likes watching uh, the videos of, of uh, lost 20-somethings on YouTube. I'll be recommending uh, a bunch of stories I didn't even recommend in the video as well, so there'll be all sorts of collections you'll see in there. Ah, oh, good songs, man. Where can I find them? I'm going to put out a playlist that covers all of the songs used, um, and, and I think by seeing them and hearing them, 
uh, on their own, it'll elucidate why I made certain choices in the video. Just to uh, indulge me for a second here, I'm gonna uh, talk about some of the choices I made. There's a lot of pieces of music in the video that are really obvious choices. Hall of the Mountain King, uh, March of the Dwarves, one of those things. However, it was important to me that some of the uh, music have different layers in, in what they were trying to achieve. Uh, you look at something like uh, Help From My Friends and Happy Together when I'm talking about the Jack and Stan runs. Now, they're both 60 songs and they're both about being a close-knit group or in some kind of love. And uh, it would have been something I could have used interchangeably, but tonally they, they're saying two different things. One being the Beatles is the opening of a culture. It's, it's the 60s in full swing. It's a song that represents something quite joyous, and I felt like that needed to be used to show the opening of, uh, you know, Stan Lee and, and Jack Kirby creating this, this team. When it comes to Happy Together, that's got a little bit more of a, a sort of um, a, a, a juxtaposed somber feel and a bit more of a pulse and a drive. And I think that needed to express the trials and tribulations of their existence in the 60s before I swing into Crazy Rhythm, which kind of sums up uh, the overall vibe of those books. I wanted stuff that was emotionally correct, and I think the most obvious example of that is everything that covers the Secret War saga at the end of the video. The song when Doom has becomes God Emperor Doom is uh, Echo and the Bunny Men's The Killing Moon, which I affectionately refer uh, to myself as the Killing Doom section, and it's uh, about life and death in the universe and just the imminent destruction of everything, and the lyrics very much reflect uh, the idea of, a, of, of an omnipresence, of a hymn that this all ties to. And then I knew I needed to counter that with uh, something like the song I used, Wonderful Wonderful. Originally I was going to use It's So Important to Make Someone Happy, which tonally is so much more human and incredibly uh, down to earth and it, Jimmy Durante sounds like Ben Grimm, so it felt like that would be a good, uh, a good choice. And the lyrics are, you know, perfect. They're about make just someone happy and you will be happy too. And that reflects uh, Reed and Doom. But it didn't make me, <laughs> it didn't make me cry. And the thing about Wonderful Wonderful is that it's so earnest and so in your face and so, I was vibing off of the end of Desperate Housewives and I'm like, it's kind of a tribute to my mum, I guess, to use the song there. So I, I just felt Wonderful Wonderful was, was the only way to go. It would have been a half measure had I not chosen that that particular choice. Same goes for Keeping the Dream Alive. I cringe at that title and that lyric, but it's 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 perfect because you need something that's that earnest. I mean, the, the story of that intro sequence is about this idea of, of failure. I mean, all the images I used are of uh, the four failing and being beat down and losing and, and, and not sure if they're going to get ahead, but they... They keep... <laughs> I'm getting choked up thinking about it. They, they, they keep moving forward and they keep pressing on. And that has always been such a great Marvel trait. Uh, maybe not for Frank Castle or someone. But 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 it's it needed to be that. It needed to be that to reflect the Fantastic Four. Anyway, so you're getting all my boomer music choices. They're all making sense now, huh? Oh, and um, the very first piece of music you hear is from the uh, Fantastic Four PS2 game. <laughs> It's the only time that's ever come in handy. And the last piece of music during the Reed Richards segment up until my final speech, it's the Roger Corman Fantastic Four theme. I also used Roger Corman's um, Fantastic Four music for uh, Doom section because those pieces of music were written specifically for them. It, emotionally, they said exactly what I needed them to say in those moments. And uh, I thought there was something poetic about giving them new life that way. I'm so glad whoever you are put them back online, like, <laughs> in the year I decided to make the video because they were gone for, for years before then. But yeah, I, I hope those choices make sense, and I really hope that they had the effect that I was going for, even if some of them are a bit under the surface and hard to hear. I love your cast! Yeah, me too, man. Uh, I... I <laughs> The decision was something uh, I had to take seriously. When I said I'm going to use voice actors, I'm like, okay, we need to set aside a budget. We need to really think about um, 
the choices we're going to make here. We need to, to not just be famous people I know who are voice actors or just my friends. It needed to be people who were, you know, looking for work and people who were affordable in my bracket, but also people who I knew would be right for the roles. Um, it's a skill I've always wanted to jump into. I mean, I have a theatrical background. I did drama school for years and it was pretty semi-professional in, in certain respects. Um, it wasn't necessarily the happiest time in my life, but it was certainly a time when I got a lot of on-the-ground experience. And uh, I've always wanted to be a, an impresario, as it were, and this was an opportunity to, to make that happen. Um, so if I was going to do it, I needed to really uh, pull my bootstraps up and uh, make it work. The search was, as, as I mentioned before, incredibly intense. It was actually, I would say, almost a month's amount of work just scouting, just going through pages and pages and pages of voice actors on YouTube, on uh, casting call clubs of all of the websites where uh, you can find voice actors. And I would find people and then go through all of their auditions and reels from other projects just to know what they were going through. I, I had a couple contacts from when I did the Sly videos because that was my first attempt to try this. That's when I knew one day I want to make more of this and this is my test run. And uh, Abigail, who played Carmelita the second time, I knew when she did that, I'm like, I've got to use this girl as, as Sue. She's, I've got to give her a go at that. It, it was incredibly uh, useful knowing her because then I started going through some of uh, the contacts she knew and that took me on a whole, you know, rabbit hole uh, journey in finding um, different places where I could pick up voice actors. That sounds kinky and weird, pick up. Ooh. I forgot to mention a couple things when I first recorded this, so I'm back to, to sort that out when it comes to the casting process. Uh, essentially, when I looked at people's reels, I was looking at their commercial reels as much as their, uh, their character reels, because you kind of sometimes, when you're looking for very natural performances, you're, you're looking for what the person just sounds like normally, and sometimes the best way you can get that is going on their commercial reel and, and just hearing how they sound in their usual situations. I think a lot of them um, really come out at their best when they have both of those reels available, so it's something I would recommend to any uh, voice actors. I know there are people in the industry who do this as well. You, you listen to uh, a range of, of, of what's in front of you when you feel you're, you're, you're getting a handle on someone you're interested in. At BMO, we create a financial plan as customized as your coffee. Even if you like your coffee, half caffeinated, not fat, half sweet, no foam, extra hot with a shot of vanilla. So uh, I would do that in the casting process. In the direction process, I would message the person, be like, are you available? Uh, what are your rates? Would you be interested in doing this? And they would get back to me or not get back to me. And then um, I would uh, I would still ask for them to audition. And based on that audition, I would give notes like, can we try something more like this? Can we do that for the full run of lines? And all of the actors were super accommodating to that process. Understandably, uh, even when I'm giving direction, they're not necessarily going to hit every beat I'm very specific about. And you want that most of the time because you want the actor's ingenuity. You want to hear what takes they're going to come back with that you might not have even thought of. There's certainly takes in the video that are purely the invention of the actors uh, rather than anything I've directed and, and why they are so integral to, to making that work. But sometimes when you're very specific with something you want, uh, you have to record your own voice file and, and get that back to them. Obviously, the optimum way to do this is is not to do it via email. It's to do it in the booth or on a Skype call or Discord call, I guess, I guess it is now. Um, you want to be there with them so that you're not wasting their time. However, we all live on completely different sides of the, the planet. We have very busy schedules, or at least they certainly do. So it's, it's, uh, it's amazing they were able to come together and deliver the quality that they did, that they, they, that they were able to commit as, as strongly and as seriously as they all did. And um, I'm, I'm really, I, you know, it's, it's, it's such a cliche, but I'm really blessed with the people uh, that we ended up with. Uh, uh, the, you know, I, I was able to find. I was just so happy with the way everybody took to it, and yeah, god damn it, everybody delivered. Um, it was it was extremely gratifying to to have that come together. So, I'll show you actually. I, I uh, for every person I cast, I made like 
uh, a folder for every scene and I color coded the folder based on uh, which actors were needed in which parts and then you know I go through and give them the requisite pages they'd be voicing so they knew exactly um, what was going on and in some cases you get brilliant stuff like Jeremy picking up on the fact that, that uh, Ben is having a little snack during the Black Panther scene, which I'd actually completely missed. So he was able to put that in the recording. It's so many... These people took it to the next level. Peter J. Canis, who plays Doom, he didn't need to, to give uh, the emotion he gave in, in the uh, Valeria and, and Doom sequence, but he, he fucking nailed it, man. Like, everybody just really rose to it. I, I cannot... I can't thank these people enough. Every last one of them um, did a terrific job. I actually, I, I want to very quickly talk about some of the choices I made because I felt it was very important for the characters to be weighted correctly. What I mean by that is, uh, take Nathaniel Richards, right? He's cast as Random Guy. I, I also obviously knew I wanted guest stars in there if I could manage it. Tomar is a big sweetheart. Can confirm. Random Guy is the person who made me want to make YouTube videos. I saw him when I was 16 uh, with his Marvel vs. DC uh, uh, videos, which then became an ongoing narrative. And I'm like, oh, you can make something out of nothing and put it to an audience and have it mean something and have it matter and have them all get into it. And it was eye-opening and brilliant. And I'm like, if I ever get to work with that guy someday, that would be amazing. So I message him to play Reed and he didn't get back to me. So I'm like, okay, I guess I'm gonna uh, find another actor. And I did. I found Alex Brody, who did an incredible job. And, you know, I'm waiting on, on um, a message back from, from uh, Alex because he's, you know, got the files and he's, he's getting to work. And I get a message back from Random Guy who says, oh, I'd love to do it. It'd be so cool to play Reed. And I'm like, oh, God damn it, because I'd love to work with him, but I'm promised to another actor now. So I go, okay, um, I gotta get him involved. So I said to random guy, look, uh, I can't give you Reed anymore because I'm promised to someone else. However, can you play Nathaniel? Because I think that would still have the same resonance. I think it would actually maybe be better if you played that role. And he said, sure, I'll do it. And uh, it ended up being better because the four, I realized, needed to be relative unknowns. They needed to be people who were on the same wavelength because the audience can't be distracted by, oh, it's that famous person, oh, it's that famous person. They needed to be right for the roles and they needed to be people I chose purely based on the performances, um, you know, within the budget. And uh, that ended up being absolutely the right choice. Alex, I can't imagine anyone else as the voice of Reed Richards. He is so totally perfect for that role. You know, I, I just felt like the four of them together, Timothy, Abigail, Jeremy, and, and Alex, while they've never met each other, their chemistry was so palpable, and it would have been stupid to, to break that up. So I, I think it worked out in the end. And the other reason for that casting of Nathaniel is that Shami was playing Franklin, and Shami represents the YouTuber I met when I finally was making money and, and in the YouTube sphere, as it were, when I'd finally started getting some attention for what I was doing, uh, no matter how big or small. And that, to me, was just a perfect sort of either end of the spectrum for me, um, to have those two in those two different roles. So yeah, that was a lot, but um, I encourage all of you, their contacts are in the description of the FF video. If you can please go to those people's socials and just tell them if you liked their work, what a great job they did. Every last one of them I am in total debt to for taking this seriously. And if they're listening, I know this, you know, gets a bit saccharine, but I really mean it uh, when I say that I greatly appreciate the time and effort, and, and more importantly, the talent, and taking it seriously. Uh, I mean, I know you were paid and everything, but you guys are... are um, you guys are going places. Some of you already are in those places, but you guys are, uh, you know... You deserve so much recognition for what you're doing. And obviously, if I have anything else going in the future, I'm going to go back to them because they are wonderful people to know and work with. And uh, uh, Marion Toro, right? She uh, told me after she did uh, Storm, she said, I've always wanted to, to play Storm. And that this was... A she didn't tell me that before I cast her or anything. She told me that after it was all done. And that was really wonderful to know that I was able to... I was able to, to give an opportunity. I was able to, to offer something to these guys, to be a part of something. And I've had a couple people come to me and, and say that. And that that's really gratifying to know that you... We, we have this thing we can all say we were in together, that we all did and, and we're all a part of. And that's, um, that's the joy of theatre, man. That's the joy of being a part of those kind of projects, is that you facilitate 
uh, something out of nothing. Uh, and it just endlessly is it's fascinating to me. Wow, I really... I really went off on this one. I'm so sorry. I have uh, bloopers coming out. Uh, I think uh, Molly in particular will be very pleased to see some of those and uh, and Peter as well. So uh, yeah, bloopers are on the way. Look out for those. Can I be a voice actor in another project that you're doing, please? Uh, I have no plans for another project like this in the immediate future, but I'm always thinking about my own projects, uh, especially now, and my DMs are open on Twitter and Discord. If you want to message me, just just literally just drop me your reels or, or your interest and I'll, I'll put you on a list, man. I'll come and find you and kill you. No, I don't mean it that way. I mean, the thing about um, me is that I try to remember everybody I cross paths with. So if I like your stuff, message me, reach out. I'll, I'll, I'll take it into consideration. Yeah, please message me your stuff. I'd love to hear it. Why didn't you talk about... <laughs> yeah, uh, trust me. If you mentioned it... Uh, I thought about it. MF, uh, The Molecule Man's True Purpose. There's a lot of things I wanted to talk about in the video that I just, I got to a point where I'm like, there are certain beats I need to hit, a certain flow that I have to have, and I, it, it would be too distracting for an audience if I, if I just inserted, uh, too many of these things. I mean, there are a lot of Easter eggs in the video, but that meant that when I put those in, I, I had to leave out other stuff. I had a friend who said I should do a commentary track, uh, pointing out all of the, uh, the stuff on screen. I feel like I'd need someone next to me to keep me focused, uh, if I was doing that, because I could just go on some of the references and stuff in there. The only one I forgot that, uh, I, I genuinely forgot and would have put in the video if I'd remembered was that Bill Murray was the voice of the Human Torch once upon a time. That's not, I'm not making that up. That was... That was the truth. The whole country is looking for the human torch. Yeah. And he's right here working with us on cars. <laughs> well, I've got to do a little welding, guys, so step back for a few seconds. Flame on! Another story I'd like to tell while I remember. Uh, I so wanted to get this in the video, but it just didn't have a place. Uh, A.V. Arod, who, you know, is still pretty big, but was huge in getting the Marvel movies made back in the day. A huge toy mogul. He was on the beach, just chilling. And uh, the Roger Corman Fantastic Four movie had just been cancelled. And uh, a kid or a fan or whatever is walking around with a Roger Corman Fantastic Four shirt on. And he goes up to him and says, Excuse me, uh, where you get that shirt? And, um, oh wow, <laughs> bee mask. What? And uh, the guy is like, I really wanted to see this movie. I'm excited for it to come out. He didn't know it had been cancelled yet. And uh, yeah, uh, I, I hope it happens. And after that, A.V. Arod ordered every copy of the movie, every original print and negative, burnt. So just a, a little insight into Mr. Put Venom in every movie. What about the MCU? Do you think they can make a good Fantastic Four? I, I am a fan of the MCU. I think they're pretty good at getting the mainstream to appreciate the basic fundamentals of the comics in the same way I do. I, I go out and I hear teenagers just casually talking about Thanos the way I used to talk about him with my friends. And, and in the same kind of nuance and depth, it's... Uh, you know, that character is still all about loving death, man. There's, there's a reason that he makes the decisions he makes as opposed to others. But anyway, that's a whole thing to get into. I know people find it controversial now if you're a critic or an artist, as if it's, like, impossible to see any merit in both The Winter Soldier and Rear Window. Like, oh, you can't get uh, David Lynch if you like the MCU. It's a, that's a conversation for a different time. But, uh, no, I, I certainly don't think they're bastions of cinema or anything, but I have faith that they can do something interesting with the FF. I have faith they can make a, not just an interesting um, adaptation, but an interesting movie. I think they could do something uh, kind of cool with it. Kind of like how with Spider-Man, they've gone back to the uh, the school 60s vibe. A lot of people don't want to really acknowledge that, but that's, again, story for a different time. Uh, yeah, no, it's, uh, they've certainly put out a couple turkeys, but I don't think they could do any worse with the FF than, than other people have. Even if it does end up being as as uh, kind of milquetoast as maybe, you know, just the way that certain other Marvel movies have been perceived. It, again, can't be worse than what they did with the other stuff. And, you know, maybe they'll do something kind of fun. I, I do have a fan cast in mind. I mean, uh, Emily Blunt is the obvious choice for Sue, but failing that, I think Rachel Brosnahan could probably pull it off. Uh, that kid from uh, Stranger Things, Billy, as, uh, as Johnny Storm. You really want someone like a Patrick Wilson, maybe with a different face. Uh, maybe you can just change his face, do a lot with that face. Uh, for me, the only cast I'm really set on is Army Hammer as Doom. If you've seen Man from Uncle, if you know he's of Russian descent, if you know uh, that he's six foot something, uh, Army Hammer is like... He's got that tragic quality, and there's two of him. 
I'd also like to say I, I love and appreciate all the comments uh, from some friends as well that basically outed the fact that I kind of already made my FF movie. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, the people you heard, they're my ideal FF cast. They're the people I've been hearing in my head since I was a very little kid. Uh, and, you know, they're all my music choices and emotional choices. It's what I would do if I was doing an FF thing. You would hate my FF. I would, uh, I'd have a lot of Yellow Submarine references and, uh, I'd direct the Latveria stuff to look like an MGM musical. You would totally hate my Fantastic Four. It would be very earnest and old school and, and weird and, and, and you wouldn't, you wouldn't be a fan. How do you feel about the new series? I have a rocky past with Dan Slott. Uh, I, when I was an edgy 19 year old, I made a video saying that uh, Dan Slott's run of Superior Spider-Man is a culmination of just all of the, the, the stuff I didn't like beforehand that he's been doing, and I framed it as though he was doing something morally bankrupt and something effectively criminal, and that was the absolute wrong angle to take, and I apologize to Dan now for uh, taking that angle. It's not to say that I, I take back what I feel about his work, and it's not to say that I don't think there were certain points raised in that video that weren't relevant, but it was a bad video, it was uh, framed on the wrong premise, and you know, Dan's just a guy working, he's got a dream job, more power to him, man. He's out there just making that bread and, and making it work. And you know, he's had ideas that I think are phenomenal, uh, it's just the writing, it's just the actual dialogue and the way it's structured and, and paced that I just can't, I can't stand. Um, which is very strong. Uh, I kind of had similar issues with Fraction's run, so it's not just limited to Dan. A Fraction did some amazing work as well, but he also did some stuff that I just, I don't really vibe with, I don't think was carried through. Uh, you can tell that he's, he's not quite inside the cat. Uh, he's not quite inside the characters, uh, he's not quite inside the mentality of, of the series and the characters. He has, he hasn't quite gotten a, a full familiarity with it. There's too much gumdrops and rainbows in both of those guys' approach in certain respects. It's very surface level and, and, and not quite digging into the meat of what makes them interesting or or, or making uh, arcs that I feel are relevant. So, no, I'm not the biggest fan of, of what's currently happening with the comic. Uh, I understand it from Marvel's perspective, though. They wanted something that was inoffensive and um, you know, a, a mainstream audience could basically get on board with. It's everything you want, come back. It's all the same beats you've read before. Fine. That It means that the FF can continue the, the way they need to. I should mention fans are probably more vocal about Dan's involvement in Fantastic Four because I have a theory that when you write for Spider-Man, you're, unless you do something really noticeably terrible, one more day, uh, it, it, you, it's pretty much bulletproof. There's a lot of writers who've gotten away with some really terrible ideas on, on Spider-Man. So, um, just because it's, you know, one of the most highest selling comics of all time in some respects. So, yeah, uh, uh, Dan is just doing what he's doing and, and it may not run the full run. It may, it may, you know, end whenever. It may not. Who cares? I got my ending with Hickman, so it's fine. However, I, I would recommend some books around the subject. Chip Zdarsky had to write the run building to Dan Slott's run, basically justifying why after the Hickman Secret Wars, the FF would come back, why Doom would be Doom again. And he did a really good job. He wrote a, a very excellent little epilogue, effectively. And I definitely recommend you read it and check it out. The same can be said for Mark Wade's Invisible Woman run. It's a very short couple of issues that cover uh, Sue as a super spy. And what I really love about it is that he basically makes a wonderful case for why Sue sticks with her family and why she isn't this super awesome super spy. It's it's a wonderful little story and it's nice to see Wade working on the book again. I also, I, I can't recommend this enough, uh, as the video was being made, Marvel released Mark Wade's History of the Marvel Universe, which covers literally everything in the Marvel Universe from, uh, you know, the beginning with the, the wartime timely stuff to the modern day. And it is beautiful because not only do single pages just the composition alone tells you so much uh of the universe so succinctly and 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 is just beautifully done it's also hinged on the fantastic four it's about galactus as the embodiment of death and franklin richards as the embodiment of life and the two of them are at the end of the universe just discussing what they've been through and galactus passes the role of Galactus to Franklin for whatever new universe may appear 
and uh, it's a wonderful end to the entire Marvel history. And when I saw that, I'm really glad the video took as long as it did because it meant I could use that for the ending. I'm like, I have to make that the final emotional beat before we end this all. Um, so uh, thank you, Mark, for making that available. I would also recommend if you want to see where the FF could have gone, uh, I understand why Marvel turned it down. Alex Ross did an amazing uh, pitch that basically said, let's do a 60s psychedelic look at the Fantastic Four, really take them back to those roots in a, in a, in a modern way, uh, visually. And, uh, you know, do something experimental and interesting with it. And uh, it, it got turned down in favor of Dan's. And I think that was the right decision because coming back with something that radical probably wouldn't have been a good move. However, you know, uh, d d d Alex wants to do it. So, like, why can't we just have that as a side story? Can we not Can we not just just give him four issues? Just, just please come on, I'm begging you. What's next for you? Any more videos like this? Uh, I'm really not sure. I was thinking about doing something Spider-Man related, because Spider-Man is my first comic book love, as it were. Uh, I have one story in mind that I think there's a lot to say about, um, and I think could make for an interesting video. Uh, I don't know. If there's enough demand for something, if people want to see me talk about... You know, there, there are characters I want to do stuff for, um... Hell, there are thing there are original things I've done with certain characters, which is like totally just fan fiction. But I wrote like a, I don't know if I should even say this. I wrote a Lois Lane uh, radio play. I did one full episode of it, and then I kind of abandoned it because I thought I need to spend my time on actual original works. But if people want to see that, maybe that's something I could do. Maybe I could make it a Patreon goal. If you want to see me cover a Spider-Man story or uh, Thunderbolts or it, it, certain comics that I really do care about and would like to see covered, um, then maybe. Maybe that's something we could we could talk about because it is it's a big time investment. It's a lot of money to make these things happen. Uh, I would have to have solid backing because you know I'm not even with this video it was a risk to make the money that that I ended up not making necessarily. So I, I'd have to really think about it. But if you're interested, please let me know and just pipe up with what could be good. Um, there's a lot of characters I think would be cool to to cover. I might try. Um, some original projects one day. I'm kind of itching to do some original work as well, so maybe that would involve uh, getting some of the gang back together. The rest is uh, just business as usual. I, I was managing shorter videos every month before this project uh, got very involved in my life, and I'd like to go back to that if possible. I've got a Luigi's Mansion 3 review, a Q&A, thoughts on El Camino, a lot of shorter projects uh, that I want to, to get done and can get done. Um, just to just to keep things rolling, um, so yeah, it's probably back to normal for a bit. Uh, but I'll, I'll I'm thinking about it. Like you know, this was so fun to do. I just need to really I need to really uh, set the the floor down for it if I'm going to do it again. And of course, it's it's difficult because the channel is so many things, and I think a lot of my fans are like. Do I really want to watch something about comic books when I've come here for video games? Do I really want to watch something about video games when I've come for comic books, etc.? There's so many different subjects and things I want to talk about, and I just kind of have to keep throwing things out there and speaking what I want to speak about and, and just see how that goes. So, we'll see. We will see if I do something else like this. Having said that, uh, that brings me on to my patrons. Thank you so much. Uh, all of you who donated to make that video possible. Uh, you know, it's it wouldn't have existed if I wasn't making money off of it. It wouldn't have happened. You paid for a lot of extremely talented people. You you uh, you gave just a lot of um, you gave a lot of opportunities, and I cannot I, I I can't express it. I can't express how brilliant that is that you you gave this to to these people that you gave it to me that you gave it to you know, my, my fans as well. Um, thank you so much. I understand that some of you have probably pledged just based on this video. It's okay if you only want to pay for that. If, you, if you're not interested in paying for the other stuff, that's fine. But thank you so much for contributing for that. It's, that's all that matters, man. And it's, it's wonderful that you would do that. I've actually set up um, 
a Kofi as well. Kofi? Kwafi? What are we going to call it? I don't know. Um, for people who just want to pay once. Who, who just want to... It's just a tip jar, basically. Because if you like my work and you don't necessarily have the ability to contribute every month, just just pay me there and it's fine. It's, it's not an issue at all, if you want to. Uh, I just thought it was worth putting those out there just to, you know, to potentially keep putting my money where my mouth is. If you like my stuff and, and pay for it, you know, maybe I should be saving up a bit better so I can get my life together and sorted and, and do so many things I want to do. But I, I feel like... Um, they really do make these projects more than they start as. They really do turn it into something uh, even I couldn't have predicted being the way they are. So, yeah, it's... Uh, thanks. It's, it's amazing. It's amazing. What a, what a world we live in. What a, Look at us. Look at us. Who'd have thought? Not me. Not me. So, thank you, everyone. Uh, back to normal. Anything else you want to know, just put comments down in the description or whatever, and I'll beep boop get into that. Um, have a wonderful week. And a wonderful year. Um, I don't know how to end videos. I just kind of... Just kind of go until my brain feels like pudding. Hmm. Jello.